They're made of rope, wood, stone, iron, steel, and the human impulse to reach out and explore. Now, Bridges on Modern Marvels. walk a world surrounded by everyday wonders, none greater than our bridges. There is something impressive about a bridge, any bridge, a problem gracefully solved, a barrier overcome, a passage achieved. Bridges are such an elegant resolution of the age-old human struggle with nature. A bridge does not conquer, exploit, or destroy. It simply, literally, overcomes. Maybe that's why people seem to have an instinctual fondness for bridges. They represent a good side of human nature. A desire to reach across, to unify, to connect. Bridges bring together what is separate, not just in the physical plane, but in what you could even call a, a spiritual way. They make it possible for us to do what I think is at the core of, of, of what it means to be a human, which is, which is to explore and to explore one's world and to expand, to reach out. I think this very simple thing, which it is linking two points, you see, and permitting people go across, has such an unbelievable power and it has such an unbelievable force. I mean, it has even almost a religious sense, you see. And this force, this is something very elementary that everybody can understand. The sheer beauty of bridges, their perfect proportions and elegant lines, is also part of their appeal. People love to look at the bridges, and there's something about the math that is suddenly physically portrayed. It's, it's I guess, mathematical poetry. And the math is portrayed in that graceful cantilever and the amazing arch that will only work in a pure mathematical way. Anything else, anything that looks improper will make it fall down. Bridges do on occasion fall down, even pretty ones. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge, for example, which came apart at the seams in 1940 in a 42 mile an hour windstorm, is perhaps the most spectacular 20th century bridge disaster. What happened was uh, a complex phenomenon of, called flutter, in which different kinds of motion begin to complement each other, and each one excites the other so that every move gets to be a, just a little bit larger than the previous one. And there is no turning back once this process starts. In structures, Murphy's Law is a rigorous law. If it can fall down, it will fall down. This bridge could. How do bridge designers go about planning these enormous, complex structures in such a way as to avoid a collapse? What are some of the key questions they must ask in developing a design? How much does the bridge itself weigh? It has to hold itself up. That's one of the first things that a, a bridge engineer will, will calculate. Can it hold itself up? And then there's the live load of everything that you put on the bridge. And you have to think worst case. What if there's a terrible traffic jam and there was a truck demonstration and every lane is filled with trucks? Then you say, what if I also added all the environmental loads? What if two feet of snow suddenly fell on the bridge at that time? So that's the challenge. It's the challenge of gravity, of defying gravity, of holding these people, these vehicles, the snow and everything up in the air. The Romans were the first great bridge builders, erecting so many bridges, it was said, that one could traverse the Roman Empire without fording a single stream. All Roman bridges are arch bridges, the dominant bridge type in the world until the 19th century. The arch is a wonderfully stable form that works through compression. That is, any pressure or weight on top of the arch is driven straight down toward the ground, where it is resisted, reinforcing the stones that make up the arch itself. 
the way that an arch is built up is, is a series of, of stones. The French had a wonderful word for it. They were called voussoirs, stones that, that had angles to them. And the way that you would build an arch, you would build a, a wooden, what we call false work, that would resemble your finished arch. And then you would begin laying the stones up till you got to the top. That top stone is called the keystone. Once the keystone's in place, you can remove your, your, your scaffolding in your form and your structure will, will, will stay in place without falling down. Rome's most amazing bridges were its aqueducts, like the Pont du Gard in Nîmes, France, composed of three tiers towering 155 feet above the River Gare and helping transport water no less than 31 miles. Incredibly, the voussoirs on the bottom and middle tiers of this great structure were cut so perfectly that they were laid in place without mortar. Compression alone has held this perfect aqueduct together for 2,000 years. What I think is wonderful in the Roman bridges, it is this unbelievable sense of gravity. You see, they are all uh, works, you know, who stays in the landscape with the same naturality as the mountains. You see, they are also all working on compression, not under tension. Uh, uh, working on compression is working like the pyramid. And sometimes they even discover mortar. You know, mortar is a weak part. So we, thought we, we, we will do bridges without mortar, just putting stones against stone, you know. So it is a, also a very deep sense of purity, you see, and a very uh, deep sense of the artistic achievement. When Rome fell in the 5th century AD, the art of bridge building fell with it. Many centuries would pass before another great bridge project was even attempted. The legendary London Bridge across the Thames, built over 33 years at the end of the 12th century, was a glorious mess of a bridge. Clumsy and ugly by Roman standards, but a bold breakthrough for its time. 935 feet long, London Bridge clopped across the Thames with no less than 19 arches and massive piers that were half as wide as the arch spans. The piers were so thick that they created a dangerous whirlpool in the river, and going under the bridge by boat was called shooting the bridge. Despite its drawbacks, this was a great and vital bridge, crammed with vendors, fashionable apartments, even a gallows. And it was a workhorse, the only bridge over the Thames for 600 years. It was finally torn down and replaced in 1831 by the heavily trafficked New London Bridge. That bridge didn't last nearly so long, sinking dangerously into the Thames and being dismantled in 1968. Bizarrely, the historic bridge was put up for sale and bought by an American who was building a resort town in Arizona called Lake Havasu. He figured London Bridge would be a great asset. And there she rests, a great bridge with a storied past. The Renaissance brought the first real advances in bridge design since Rome, as architects explored ways to elongate the arch. Arches became continually more and more refined and more and more bold in, in their proportions. Uh, an arch which is completely circular is very safe. And if you note, the Roman arches are indeed circular. As you want to span longer distances, you open the arch more and more, and the risk of having it break in the middle or kick out at the foot increases. But gradually builders did become more and more audacious, and arches did get a different proportion. They became lower and longer gradually. Many of the great bridges of Paris were built by a pioneering bridge designer named Jean Rodolphe Perronet, who perfected the Masonry Arch Bridge. Perronet made a revolutionary discovery about arches. Their thrust is not entirely downward, but also lateral. Piers, it turned out, could be much thinner than anyone thought, one-fifth the size of those of Rome, so long as solid abutments picked up the stress on either side. 
where you get more of an elliptical or flat arch, you begin to, to develop thrust. In other words, the tendency of that arch to want to push out. And so you've got to come up with another solution to rest restrain that thrust. And the solution is massive abutments, a massive amount of stone that's going to counteract the tendency of that arch to want to, to, to move out. Peroné designed the Pont de la Concorde in Paris in 1791 when he was 82. The bridge, which stretches across the Seine in a few elegant strides, is considered his masterpiece. Since ancient times, stone had been the only material one could use in building a major span. At the end of the 18th century, all that was about to change. Until the end of the 18th century, bridges had been pretty much constructed of two materials, wood and stone. In 1779, in the industrial Midlands of England, a new material was introduced, cast iron. Iron Bridge, as it was called, spanned the Severn River outside the tiny village of Colebrookdale, where it augured a revolution in bridge construction and design. Small, quiet, delicate. This is the forerunner of the iron and steel monsters of the 19th and 20th centuries. Not just arch bridges, but suspension spans as well. A local foundry commissioned iron bridge as a way of showing off what cast iron, which was stronger, more flexible and cheaper than stone, could do. Ironically, though appointed to the future, iron bridge was erected like a bridge from the past. It is a beautifully made bridge, and what's interesting about it is if you look at the way they worked the iron, they worked the iron as though it were wood. And the construction of the bridge is a mirror of wood construction. It was as though they were just learning how to use the material. The bridge, which consists of five arching ribs and 800 pieces of iron, is held together like woodwork, without a single bolt. Instead, tongue and groove fittings and screws keep it in place. At first, Iron Bridge was admired more as a novelty than a breakthrough. But when it was the only bridge to survive a flood on the Severn, engineers took note. Indeed, the Manai Strait Bridge, built off the coast of Wales in 1826, used iron chains to hold up a record-setting 580-foot suspension span. Designed by renowned engineer Thomas Telford, this was the world's first large-scale suspension bridge, a quantum leap that launched an era of suspension supremacy that continues to this day. The principle behind the suspension bridge is simple. Cables anchored in an abutment on one end are strung over two towers and then anchored in an abutment on the other end. The suspended cables support a roadway and deck by way of smaller vertical cables or suspenders. Suspension bridges existed before iron, but on a very small scale, with hemp and fibers used to hold up the bridge. Telford fashioned 16 wrought iron I-bar chains made up of hundreds of small iron bars bolted together at either end, like a bicycle chain. He put the giant chains through hundreds of load tests to make sure they were strong enough to hold up the Mammoth Bridge. 1,710 feet long counting the approaches, the Manai Strait was the longest bridge in the world in 1826, a first for a suspension span. While Europe was exploring the possibilities of iron and the suspension bridge, America was throwing up thousands of covered truss bridges made of wood. Wooden bridges flourished in the U.S. more than anywhere else in the world. Convenience was a major reason. With huge forest lands, wood was available and cheap. Also, a strong, highly creative woodworking tradition produced literally hundreds of truss designs. A truss bridge is one that uses its frame to help prop itself up. A frame based on the power of the triangle the strongest geometric shape around. The basic concept of a truss bridge is a three-sided triangle. And the phenomenon about the three-sided triangle is it's the only form out of a rectangle, a trapezoid, a circle, 
that will not change shape if you, if you put a force on it. So a series of, of rigid triangles arranged in some sort of configuration, which is uh, what differentiated between the different truss types is, is the fundamental principle of the truss. Most of the bridges were covered to protect them from the elements. Toll keepers often had to shovel snow onto these so-called kissing bridges to accommodate sleighs. The railroads put an end to the wooden bridge. Trains were simply too heavy and threw off sparks that set many bridges on fire. By the 1840s, metal truss bridges were sweeping the country. Bridges that literally came in a box and could be assembled by a crew of farmers in a few days. These bridges were usually fabricated in, in the eastern industrial centers such as Pittsburgh where a small factory would, would fabricate a bridge. It would be laid out on the factory floor, pre-assembled to make sure that all the pieces went together, then broken apart, loaded on a railroad, uh, shipped you know, 150, 250 miles across the country and then uh, be re-erected in the middle of nowhere. The race to come up with the perfect truss design intensified. 800 truss patents were issued overall. Scores of bridge factories competed to build up the small town infrastructure of America, erecting tens of thousands of prefabricated metal bridges by century's end. The great American achievement in 19th century bridge building was not, however, the prefabricated metal truss. The Civil War jump-started the country's iron and steel industries, and bridge builders turned their attention to the exciting possibilities of the suspension bridge. John Roebling, a German immigrant engineer, came up with a new kind of suspension cable that would revolutionize suspension spans. Roebling's great breakthrough was the use of parallel wires, pencil-thin wires, together, packed together, providing a strength that would be greater and a flexibility that would be greater than a steel beam or an iron beam. So whereas in the past you might have had an eye bar or bar going from location to location, now you would have a series of strands of, of steel wire. And the steel wire together is A, as strong or stronger, B, as flexible or, or it's more flexible, and C, allow for some breakage without a failure. Roebling's iron rope allowed the suspension bridge to span unheard of lengths. In 1869, he began work on a bridge over New York's East River between Brooklyn and Manhattan. A 1,600-foot span, 500 feet longer than the longest suspension bridge in the world. Impossible, the experts agreed. One of the great British engineers wrote to Roebling that his bridge is insane and impossible, but should it be proven possible, everybody else would look stupid. And it definitely is possible. It has been there for 115 years now. It took 14 years and more than 20 lives, including Roebling's, to build the Brooklyn Bridge. But build it he did. The Brooklyn Bridge is the first truly modern bridge. In both construction and design, this was the prototype for the great suspension landmarks of the 20th century. Roebling pioneered the process and the technique for building a bridge on such a scale. The use of pneumatic caissons to dredge out the riverbed and lay massive foundations. The endless, painstaking spinning of cables, building them up wire by wire, 5,434 wires per strand, 19 strands per cable, four cables in all. Most importantly, at a time when many suspension bridges were collapsing from heavy traffic and wind, Roebling figured out a way to stabilize a giant suspension span, designing a triple system of supports that could withstand every kind of stress. And Roebling invented a structural scheme which he was confident, correctly so, would resist any wind. Uh, this scheme consists of the suspension system, which in turn has the cables and the suspenders. That alone is enough to keep the bridge up.
But also there are these diagonal stays fanning out from the top of the tower towards the, the roadway. And then he has a quite substantial stiffening truss going alongside the bridge. Roebling argued if any one of these three systems should fail, the other two will sustain the bridge and prevent the collapse. As it happens, one, one of the systems did fail. The diagonal stays failed due to corrosion. They corroded so much that one, one fell down, owing to the large degree of redundancy that he built into his bridge, it was not a problem replacing any one component at the time. Roebling may have launched the modern era of monumental spans, but the coming century would soon produce bridges that would make the Brooklyn Bridge seem small. There are many great bridge cities in the world, Paris, for example, or New York, or San Francisco. From an engineering point of view, none of the great Bay Area bridges is more impressive than the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge. The workhorse bridge of the region, more than 100 million vehicles a year cross the Bay Bridge, 280,000 a day, more than any other bridge in the world. Built during the depression of the 1930s and opened in 1936, this hybrid bridge, part suspension, part cantilever, part truss, stretches an incredible eight and a half miles over the deep and difficult waters of the San Francisco Bay. Everybody thinks of the Golden Gate Bridge when they go to San Francisco. I think about the Oakland Bay Bridge. I think that's even nicer than the Golden Gate. It's, it's almost magical in the sense that it's two suspension bridges, and I wonder how many people notice the anchorage that's built right into the water there. And so you think that that's a suspension bridge that goes on forever, but it really is just two separate suspension bridges joined together and creating this elegant catenary that seems to go on for miles and miles. The Bay Bridge design is unique. A double suspension bridge, each half of which is bigger than the Brooklyn Bridge, runs from San Francisco to Yerba Buena Island in the middle of the bay. A double-deck tunnel carries traffic through the island and onto the eastern half of the bridge, which consists of one of the world's largest cantilever spans and a long series of trusses that extend to the Oakland shore. The most remarkable part of this bridge, as is often the case, is the part you can't see, the underwater anchorages and piers. Massive piers had to be founded at record depths, as much as 240 feet to bedrock on the eastern side. An artificial island, meanwhile, had to be built in the middle of the bay to anchor the two suspension spans. This central anchorage was made of pure concrete, more than went into the Empire State Building. People may think an anchorage is simply a block that just stands there, but it's got an enormous function. It has the entire responsibility of holding up that bridge. Now imagine in the Bay Bridge, you've got the forces of the first bridge trying to pull it up this way and the forces of the other bridge trying to pull it up in the other the opposite direction and you're trying to, to be right in the center of a waterway in which you've got some harsh currents and harsh conditions. That's a magnificent concept, just dreaming it up took a lot of courage. 520-foot towers, the size of 60-story high-rises, and the largest structures in the Bay Area skyline consumed 18% of all the steel produced in the U.S. in 1934. 70,000 miles worth of pencil-thin wire went into the cables that hold up this extraordinary span. As an engineering triumph, the Bay Bridge was hailed as the greatest bridge of its time. Only a year after it opened in 1936, however, another bridge stole the spotlight. A bridge located just to the north, across the waters of the Golden Gate Strait. The Golden Gate, perhaps the most famous, most beautiful suspension bridge in the world. And it was world champion in length until Verrazano came along. And that was in 1964. 
it's a magnificent bridge. It, uh, obviously, the surroundings, which are also magnificent, help. But it's it's uh, an extremely beautiful masterpiece of a structure. A masterpiece that took tremendous determination and will to complete. The waters of the Golden Gate were even more turbulent than those of the San Francisco Bay. A 1,000-foot trestle, or temporary roadway, that carried materials from San Francisco to the South Pier was destroyed by a storm. After five months of repairs, it was destroyed again, this time by a ship lost in the fog. A year into construction, engineers had to come up with another way of building the pier. But when it was finished, the Golden Gate, with its 4,200-foot central span, famous Art Deco towers, and striking paint job, was immediately hailed as a triumph of engineering and art. A color called International Orange was used to paint this bridge because of the way it complements the Golden Gate Strait. If you take the Golden Gate in San Francisco, you will see a symbiosis or a synergia between bridge and place. I mean, the bridge is so beautiful that it makes this place even more beautiful. And the place is also so beautiful that makes the bridge completely unique. The Golden Gate was the longest suspension bridge in the world until 1964, when the Verrazano Narrows in New York passed it by 60 feet. The Verrazano is still the longest suspension span in the US. But size isn't everything when it comes to evaluating a bridge. The vast majority of the 550,000 bridges in the United States are relatively small. A small bridge with a long lifespan is just as much as an achievement as a short-lived bridge with a long physical span. Some of the most notable small bridges in America are in Central Park, which boasts no less than 38 spans, none of them alike, all of them carefully designed to blend in with the park. Huddlestone Bridge is made from rocks that were excavated while digging nearby roads. The stones were laid dry, without mortar, and create an arch that seems to have tumbled into place. Gold Arch Bridge is one of five iron bridges in Central Park, which has half the iron bridges in the U.S. Built between 1859 and 1861, these graceful Gothic spans are beautifully detailed, and help maintain the escape from the city ambience of the park. In fact, the bridges of Central Park play a crucial role in protecting that ambience. Camouflaged overpasses, like this one, separate people going through the park from cars and buses below. They sunk those roads below the grade of the park so that traffic actually moves across the park but you never, you never know it. You walk over the bridge and you walk across it. And um, if they were at grade and you had stoplights and everything, rather than having one big park of 843 acres, you really would probably end up with five smaller parks just because of the, of the traffic flow. Anyone interested in learning about bridges would do well to visit Pittsburgh, a city with more bridges per capita than any place in the world except Venice, Italy. Pittsburgh doesn't have hundreds of canals, but it does have three rivers, the Monongahela, Allegheny, and Ohio, which at least partly explains why more than 1,700 bridges are needed to help people get around the city and its environs. Pittsburgh is like a miniature model of Manhattan itself, uh, where everything is reduced except the number of bridges, which has not only not been reduced, but actually been increased. They have arches, they have trusses of all kinds. Uh, it's, it's like kids let loose to build any kind of bridge they would possibly like. And, and they build new ones, they, they maintain the old ones. It's an exciting place, for, particularly for steel bridges. Pittsburgh, of course, was the steel capital of the world for much of the century. And what better way to use and showcase huge amounts of steel than in a bridge? 
What you have in Pittsburgh is you have a lot of really beautiful bridges, bridges that were designed to be beautiful, that were designed to make a statement, that were designed to say, we're Pittsburgh, we are the industrial center of America, we're important, look at these beautiful things we can build. Three of the most beautiful bridges in Pittsburgh are the 6th, 7th, and 9th Street bridges. The Three Sisters, as they're called. Identical suspension spans lined up in a row. What makes these bridges unusual beyond their configuration is the fact that they are old-fashioned I-bar suspension bridges, held in place by steel chains rather than wire cables. And that they are self-anchored, that is, they aren't held in place by huge anchorages on each side. Instead, the suspension cables are tied to the deck itself, which holds the structure in place. Another impressive rarity is the Smithfield Bridge, the city's oldest, designed and built in 1883 by Gustav Lindenthal, a legendary bridge engineer of the last century. Called a lenticular truss because of its parabolic or lens-like design, this is the last double-span bridge of its kind in the United States. This slender concrete giant, the Westinghouse Bridge, was the longest and highest concrete arch highway bridge in the world when it was built in 1932. It crosses over an industrial valley, the Turtle Creek Valley, and the architects and engineers said that they wanted to bring order to the chaos of the valley, which was already crossed by three layers of transportation, and there's two big mills down there, and there's a stream down there. And then just rising up above this valley is this marvelous, slender bridge. And it's such a contrast to the rest of the valley. And that's the goal they were striving for. They wanted beauty, not just functionality at that bridge. I think it's the loveliest bridge in Allegheny County. The American Bridge Company, an offshoot of U.S. Steel, fabricated the steel for all of Pittsburgh's bridges, along with thousands of other bridges around the world. The bridge building operation was so huge that an entire town grew up around it. Ambridge, short for American Bridge. All told, these fabrication workshops, which were shut down in the 1980s, churned out steel parts for over 10,000 bridges, including the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, the Mackinac Bridge, and many other landmark spans. But for all her bridges, there is one species of bridge that Pittsburgh does not have, the movable bridge. The movable bridge. As a rule, the one thing we want our bridges not to do is move. But there are exceptions. A whole category of bridges that work like giant machines, regulating conflicting lines of land and water traffic. We have a wide variety of movable bridges. I think they're the most fun. It's the problem of, of how do you get a ship going through, how do you get the traffic over, uh, how do you solve that problem? And there are half dozen different ways people have solved that problem. Well, maybe you swing the bridge on an axle and the bridge just rotates and then boats can go by. That's one way. Maybe the bridge opens like a drawbridge and you know you have a single uh, leaf drawbridge or a double leaf drawbridge. Maybe you could have a bridge just lift up vertically. I mean, isn't that, that a great concept? Somebody thinks that the bridge will just go vertically. Those are lift bridges and give you the widest possible way for ships to pass, but don't give you uh, the height. Uh, there's another bridge that's very rare, although we're lucky we have one in New York City, and that's a retractal bridge. And that kind of combines a bridge with railroads. The bridge becomes a, a, a railroad. It's on rail lines and slides out of, out of the way. And the Carroll Street Bridge is a beautiful example of it. Movable bridges are usually located in cities where land is too expensive to build the long approach roads needed for high-level fixed bridges. Trains, which can only rise at a 1% grade, need 5,000 feet to ease on to a fixed bridge that's just 50 feet high. One of the most celebrated and largest movable bridges in the world is the Tower Bridge of London, a bascule or drawbridge type bridge with a 1,045 ton roadway that opens up to let traffic on the Thames River pass. This majestic bridge was built in the 1890s across the Pool of London, 
the busiest port in the world at that time. It gave millions of East Londoners a desperately needed way of getting across the Thames without in any way hindering the hundreds of ships that passed in and out of the pool each day. A triumph of Victorian engineering, the bridge was powered by enormous steam engines, the largest in the world at one time, which opened and closed the massive decks in less than a minute. Impatient pedestrians can still use a unique bridge within a bridge, connecting the towers at the top to cross over while the bascules are up. Located adjacent to the Tower of London, Tower Bridge is wrapped up in masonry and detailed like a medieval tower to fit in with its historic surroundings. In fact, this is one of the first great modern steel bridges made to look like an antique. The effect of this architectural costume is magical. It happens to this once you add stone to it. You see, the stone is a support to your imagination. And then you can transport even your dreams, you know, to that. I'm thinking it is more than a bridge, it's a castle or something like that. You understand? And it is a fortress. And it works so well with the whole surrounding, with the city of London, with the character of the city of London, that the bridge itself is such a landmark to London as much as the houses of the parliament. I would love to go over to London and operate the Tower Bridge. I mean, that is such a huge bridge. And just feel what it feels like to operate a bridge that large. You know, that must be really something for that guy when he operates that bridge. Movable bridges, of course, aren't always so large. This bascule across the Gowanus Canal in the Bronx is barely 100 feet long, which makes it a giant compared to this one-man swing bridge which opens up to let the occasional boat pass by. For all their diversity, the potential range and structure of bridges has barely been tapped. The 21st century promises to bring an unprecedented imaginative quality to bridge design. When bridge experts talk about the future of bridges, one name keeps popping up, Santiago Calatrava. Who is Santiago Calatrava? We're all watching anxiously to find out. Santiago Calatrava is a Spanish bridge designer living in Zurich, who at the age of 48 has already designed over 50 bridges worldwide. Startling, original bridges, unlike any that have come before. He's uh, an extremely talented man who has stated that to him, uh, it's only one art, the art of building, and he employs his talents in building a bridge or a building or children's toys, as the case may be, uh, and he does not comprehend the division between architects and engineers, particularly when applied to himself. Unlike many contemporary engineers, Calatrava sees bridges as more than mere infrastructure. What I discover in the bridges, it is their capacity to dignify a place, a landscape. And I think it is essential, you know, to use the element of a bridge as much as you can use in a city the element of a cathedral or the element of a particular sculpture or a particular work of art, you know, who will dignify the, the, the life of the surrounding, who will dignify the image of the city, who will dignify and contribute to the people. Calatrava bridges, like this slender beauty outside Paris, appeal to the imagination and the eye. His bridges are unusually suggestive, and one of his favorite metaphors is the anatomy, especially the skeleton, which is evident in many of his designs. Once you go into the bridge itself, you discover that still there is a very wide march of expression in a bridge. This expression, in my case, in my particular case, is very much related to the structural nature, and so I try always to signify relations to bones or relation to a skelet or to the uh, spine of fishes. The Alamillo Bridge in Seville, Spain, is one of Calatrava's most innovative. Normally, a cable-stayed bridge of this type is held in place by cables radiating from both sides of a vertical mast. Calatrava discovered that by leaning the mast and building up its weight, he could do away with the cables on one side, creating a strikingly suggestive minimalist span. 
you can say it is a sailboat, it is a, a, a harp, you see, to do music, a gigantic harp, you know, you can even think, you know, it is like a bird, you know, who goes up into the sky. We cannot stop our imagination to associate images. However, I would like very much to underline the steps who brought me to the Alamillo was very much related to the idea of making a bridge, you know, who is even more essential than the most essential cables of state bridges built until this moment. To do a bridge is almost a secret. You see, it is a secret because it takes a lot of years until you get the essence of the statics, until you get the essence of the behavior of the bridge. And the more you study them, the more you respect them. You respect them in two terms. You know, you respect them because it is difficult to do bridges and because it is beautiful to do bridges, but you respect also them because it is dangerous to do bridges. And so I think it is certainly, you know, it's, a, it's an art, my opinion is a high art, it's a difficult one that you cannot improve from one day to another. You need almost a whole life. Kalatrava's disciplined yet audacious approach to bridges will soon be in evidence in the United States. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, he is currently building a suspended footbridge with a 200-foot angled mast for the Milwaukee Art Museum. And to revive downtown Dallas, he has convinced the city to fill the dry bed of the Trinity River with water and then decorate it with a series of water bridges. While Calatrava searches for new ways to shape a bridge, the centuries-old march to build the biggest, longest, widest bridge in the world goes on. The Japanese, who launched the greatest bridge-building program in history in 1970, a $27 billion project to link their islands with 18 major spans, now boasts the world's longest suspension bridge. The Akashi Kaikyo Bridge, linking Kobe and Awaji Island, has a once inconceivable 6,527 foot span. That's four times the length of the Brooklyn Bridge and a third longer than the Golden Gate. Where will it all end? Have we come close to reaching a limit on our ability to span? In a word, no. New materials, super light, super strong plastic fibers will make seemingly impossible bridges viable. Already there's been serious talk of throwing a suspension bridge across the 23-mile English Channel and of connecting Sicily to the Italian mainland across the Messina Strait. Before getting carried away imagining super spans of the future, however, we'd better learn to take care of the bridges we already have. Bridge maintenance rather than construction is the big challenge facing bridges today. Budget cuts and neglect have caused the collapse of scores of spans and the decay of thousands more. In the 1970s, no less than 40% of the bridges in America were deemed structurally deficient. A major mistake people have is they think a bridge is just there, it's physical and needs very little attention. In fact, the bridge is moving. It's moving, it could be swaying back and forth, it could be rising and falling with the load, it could be expanding and contracting based on temperature. And as a result, it has to have lots of movable parts. All those parts have to be lubricated, they have to be kept clean. This is a machine. And if you don't take care of it, it will freeze, it will break, and it will fail. You see, bridges are not only part of the natural landscape, I would like also to underline that they are also very much part of a cultural landscape, so they are also part of our culture, and the new generations will judge us as well or as bad according to the quality of the bridges that we have built. And perhaps, according to the sincerity of our desire to reach across and join. <laughs>